here we go uh so first off thank you so much for joining again um i'm gonna kick it off by telling you a little bit about the work we do at efficiency vermont uh and uh then i'm gonna hand it off to jake marin who's gonna actually give you the details you want um, about heat pumps uh, and a couple things to know for the presentation today um, you are going to have the opportunity to ask questions in a lot of different ways so if you are on your zoom and you see some options at the bottom of your screen there's a q a option and there's a chat feature you're welcome to enter questions into the q a section or the chat feature uh, in addition to that, something we're going to try out today, so please bear with me, it might be fun, uh, is if you have a question that you want to say out loud, that you want to be on camera for and that you want to ask us, just raise your blue hand when we complete the presentation and I'll call on people and we'll promote you to panelists so that you can talk directly to us and ask your question. Might be a bit more of a conversation. So if you've got something that you're not quite sure how to word or you want to ask it, um, uh, using your voice and not your keyboard, um, we are going to try to make space for that at the end. So good luck. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and I do already see that we've got some stuff in the chat. So that's great. Uh, so thank you for uh, doing that. We'll try to capture those uh, when we uh, get to the end of the presentation or if it makes sense and it's relevant, uh, we might even respond during. Okay, so a little bit about Efficiency Vermont. Uh, I'm a community engagement manager, so it's my entire job to help spread the word about the work we do. Uh, and you'll see on this slide uh, a couple of photos of what we do, um, whether it be uh, giving uh, information about energy efficiency upgrades, working one on one with a small business or a customer, uh, an individual, uh, a nonprofit a uh, community group like your energy committee, your municipality, really we're here to serve uh, every Vermonter and help them be able to access uh, the things that they want to do when it comes to energy efficiency. So that can take a lot of work, but we're here to do it. So the goal is to reduce your energy costs. Uh, and a little bit about Efficiency Vermont. Uh, when we talk about the investment we make uh, in Vermont, uh, it's pretty clear to me when I look at these numbers, we actually get back more than we put in when we talk about efficiency, meaning the amount that we put in to cover improving our efficiency to save money on energy. We see that coming back and actually saving Vermonters money uh, for that $1 for every invested, uh, we see $2 in return. So pretty cool. Uh, and moving beyond money, we also think a lot about how we can lower our emissions uh, and carbon comes into that. So I really like this last uh, blurb you can see right here, um, which talks about how we make an impact when it comes to removing uh, metric tons of carbon in our state. Uh, so today you're going to learn again a little bit about who we are, and then we're going to dive into the heat pumps piece. So not only do I get to work um, with my colleagues at Efficiency Vermont, but we work really closely and partner with all sorts of different outfits, uh, including your electric utility. Um, if you're from Norwich and you're joining this webinar uh, online from your home in the Upper Valley, then you're likely a Greenmount Power customer. So that would be your electric utility. We also have a diverse network of contractors uh, who are uh, a part of the EEN or the Efficiency Excellency Network. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, we work closely with some credit unions. So just to highlight again, um, we're an EU or an efficiency utility, uh, which, is a special dis uh, which is a special descriptor for the work that we do, meaning we're still regulated like a, a public utility. Uh, and we are your hub for all sorts of information. Again, if you're Green Mountain Power customers, this would be who your electric utility is. If you're from other parts of the state, you might have Washington Electric, Vermont Electric. You might have your small municipal uh, utility being your provider. Uh, or you could be uh, from anywhere in the state, um, wherever you get your electricity, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, and then again, that uh, contractor network. 
and some credit unions. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the financing at the end. So if you're thinking about a project when it comes to heat pumps, we do work closely with local credit unions. Okay, so now, drum roll please, um, you get to hear about heat pumps, what you came here for. So I'm gonna pass the baton over to Jake. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, Jake, I didn't fully introduce you. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about uh, the work that you do in your title uh, to uh, set that up. Hey. I just approved remote control, Jake. So, woo. so I can, all right, good. All right, before we jump in, into that, um, Yes, thank you. So my name is Jake Marin. Uh, I work with Becca, of course, at Efficiency Vermont. I'm really psyched to be here talking to you guys today about one of my favorite topics, heat pumps. Um, in fact, I'm often referred to as the heat pump guy at Efficiency Vermont. I've been with Efficiency Vermont now for almost 10 years. Um, this August will be my 10, 10 year anniversary and I've been working with heat pumps since about 2013. So heat pumps are something that are definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, I do all of, I'm a program manager. I do all of the uh, creation and management of all of our heat pump programs. So with that, um, now I seem to, oh, there it is, they've come back. So I'm gonna start off with just a little bit of science and I don't want the this one slide to scare anybody off, but so just take this ride with me. Um, this is really the core of how a heat pump works. Um, it's also important to understand that heat pumps uh, are something that we are all very familiar with and have been living with for our whole lives, which um, an example of that is a refrigerator. So refrigerators, air conditioners, what we tend to think of as heat pumps, ductless mini splits. These are all different versions of the same thing and they all work off of one basic concept, which is called the refrigerant cycle. And so the refrigerant cycle starts uh, with a couple of major components. We've got an evaporator and we've got a condenser. Now, I don't want this to confuse people if you think about, well, where, where are the two different parts? I know one is outside and one is inside which is which, well, it's a little confusing with heat pumps because heat pumps actually switch the location depending on whether or not you are, uh, it's really switching the operation, but the function, functional evaporator and functional condenser do change depending on whether you're heating your space or you're cooling it. So just to start off, um, let's assume that the evaporator, since you know air conditioning is really where all this started, let's assume the evaporator is inside the house and that is the heat source. That is where you actually have more heat than you want there to be. And then you have a heat sink, which is where you might wanna ditch that heat, get rid of that heat, and that's outside the building. So you've got this evaporator, let's start there. So it's also important to acknowledge that there's um, the connection between that evaporator and that condenser, that indoor and outdoor component is some piping filled with a material called a refrigerant. And this is really just a transfer medium. It's just a, a, a material that we can heat up and cool down and heat up and cool down. We don't use up refrigerant. It's all just in the system. And as long as the system doesn't leak out, it should stay there for the life of the equipment. So the first step is that that refrigerant um, comes in as a liquid into the evaporator and it's a, um, it's a chilled liquid. And so when it gets to the evaporator, uh, it's absorbing heat. It actually boils that refrigerant, uh, causes it to actually you know, evaporate, become a gas, right? That's where the evaporator piece comes from. So the refrigerant is running through that coil you see in the form of a spiral here, absorbing heat from the space it's in, your living room, for example. Um, it then moves throughout the refrigerant piping to a compressor. The compressor is something like a bike pump or uh, an air compressor. All this is doing is increasing the pressure of that gas that's coming, that refrigerant gas that comes into it. The the, and when you increase, if you think back to high school science, when you increase pressure, you also increase temperature. Again, if you think about a bike pump, as you begin to pump up your tire, if you feel your, your um, 
pump actually gets hot. It's because as you increase pressure, temperature also increases. So when you then take the interesting, oh, there it comes. Um, you're then taking that pressurized hot gas to your condenser. And the condenser really functionally is almost identical or really pretty much is identical to the evaporator. It's just a coil and with a fan. And the coil, uh, in that case, you're bringing this hot gas in. And what happens is it's dumping into a relatively cooler space. So you're rejecting heat. You're, you're dumping that all that heat that you have, in this case, out into the outdoor air. What ends up then happening is that, that the refrigerant gas, as it cools down, actually condenses, becomes a liquid again. So we've gone through a phase change. And what kind of part of the magic here is that as materials go through phase change, they actually either absorb or reject large amounts of energy, which is what we're, we're using physics to our advantage. So from here, this cooled liquid refrigerant goes into something called an expansion valve. And all that really does is release the pressure that we have built up in the system. And when you release pressure, uh, what ends up happening is we actually have, it, it cools down, right? It's the inverse of, of the um, increased pressure causing it to warm up. Reduced pressure causes it to cool down. We then have a cool liquid refrigerant comes into the evaporator and the whole process repeats. So that is the magic behind the curtain. Um, so uh, yeah, and as, as one of our, uh, one of our uh, attendees said, how does this really work? It's magic. And I think the, the, the truth is you can, you can talk about the science all day and um, Bob's right. It really truly is magic. And so the only thing I'll say here is it is important um, to acknowledge that this system, of course, when you want to heat in the building, it just switches. The heat source becomes the, the outdoor air uh, and the heat sink becomes the house. Talk a little bit more about this in a bit. Uh, and of course, the efficiency piece is, is a critical component of, of why we are propo you know, huge proponents of heat pumps. For one kilowatt hour of electricity we put in, we're actually getting three kilowatt hours of, of heat energy out. Um, the, if we were talking about electric resistance heat, that would be one kilowatt hour in, one kilowatt hour out. So we're really kind of leveraging electricity to run an operation, which is to just move heat from one location to another. And because of that, we get these incredible efficiencies that are really not uh, realizable through uh, in any other kind of, of heating system. Okay, so that, that's the science piece. Um, I know that was a lot, but uh, hopefully getting back to some, some stuff that's a little bit more relatable to you all. So to start off, um, if you look at the number on the left, 30,000, this is the number of heat pumps um, that we've installed in Vermont. So this is not a new technology to Vermonters. I told you we've been working, I've been working on this since 2013. We've seen dramatic increase in adoption and people really love their heat pumps. 14,000, the number on the right is the number of, uh, you can use this same technology to heat water. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Also, not a new technology, things that Vermonters are, are adopting at, at a really regular pace. So I want to dispel some myths about heat pumps. These are questions or comments that come up all the time, every time we have conversations about heat pumps. For one, uh, there's a, a sense or, or a notion that heat pumps don't really work when it gets you know, really cold outside. You know, is that fact or is that fiction? Um, and I will say that Although that used to be true, that is no longer true. So we are now seeing heat pumps, uh, and this is improving all the time. We are now seeing heat pumps that can put out 100% of their rated capacity, right? The amount of heat that they can put out um, down to even negative five degrees. And they will continue operating uh, really to any temperature that we would ever see in Vermont, minus 20, 30, they do lose efficiency and some output capacity when they get down into those super cold temperatures, but they can uh, continue to put out a lot of heat. And there's a bunch of 
technology reasons uh, why this is better controls, something called an enhanced vapor injection. Uh, but um, suffice to say, the technology is not your grandmother's heat pump. There's also a notion that if I, you know, move to electric heat by getting a heat pump, it's going to just, you know, increase my electric bill. And although that is true, uh, and you should anticipate that if you put in a heat pump, you will see an increase in your electric bill. You will also see a corresponding reduction in your fuel bill uh, because you will be running it a lot less. Heat pumps cannot or will not fully heat a whole home. Using the displacement model, and I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about what I mean there, they don't need to, right? So you don't need to be concerned about a heat pump's ability to heat a whole home if you use a certain approach that I'm going to be, that I'm a big proponent of. That said, um, if you have a properly weatherized building, especially newer buildings, um, we are seeing a lot of them run exclusively on heat pumps without any other kind of backup or supplemental heating. So um, jumping into the next section here, this is just to sort of show you what uh, heat pumps are healthier than gas or wood. Um, absolutely something that a lot of people, uh, a lot of people are in agreement with you, Nikki, on that one. So as far as uh, different types of heat pumps, so just to run through, uh, we all may have a, an image of what heat pumps look like in our head, but there are actually many different types of heat pumps. Uh, and I'm talking about heat pumps for heating your heating your home, heating and cooling your home. So this is a, a schematic or just the basic concept around a ductless heat pump. Um, as per the name ductless, there are no ducts. You have uh, an outdoor unit that sits usually on a stand or on a bracket cut to the side of the house. And then you'll have some sort of indoor unit uh, not utilizing ductwork that just directly kind of heats and cools the space uh, in, inside. It can be a one, mounted on the wall, mounted on the floor, mounted inside the ceiling. There's all sorts of options, but these are all versions of what we call ductless heat pumps. And again, of course, we know that these can heat and cool. And this gives you a visual of what the outdoor component looks like uh, in these, with these ductless heat pumps. In fact, this is really what kind of most of heat pumps look like, whether they're ductless or not. The outside part tends to look something like this. It's really, you're seeing that either big square or circular hole is for the fan. And then you can kind of see a little bit into the, uh, the coil on the inside. This is where that refrigerant tubing runs. There's some, usually some aluminum fins on there just to increase surface area, get better heat exchange. But really nothing much in there, a little bit of extra electronics. This is where the compressor lives. Um, so a lot of the electronics and the components are, are, are outside. This is a uh, what some of the indoor op options look like. Um, the most ubiquitous are these wall mount units. You can see the gentleman from Vermont Energy mounting one on, on a wall, high wall. But the bottom left, you can see there's floor mount units as well. Uh, we don't have any pictures here of uh, ceiling mounts. There are ones that look kind of like the ones that go on the wall, but they hang on the ceiling. There are others that are recessed ceiling. So you actually, they're flush with the finished ceiling. Uh, so there are, again, a lot, of a lot of different options. So in addition to the ductless heat pumps that are really sort of forms of space heaters, um, kind of like a Renai or something might be, there's also ducted heat pumps. So inducted with ducted heat pumps, the outdoor piece looks very similar or can look very similar. Instead of bringing into a unit that hangs on your wall or on your ceiling, uh, you're actually tying into ductwork, which can uh, have some really great, you know, interesting benefits. For one, you don't have anything hanging on your wall uh, or, or, or mounted on your floor, which can be uh, for a lot of people, something they really find distasteful, the look of these things hanging in their nice spaces. So by tying into your ductwork, you don't have to look at those things. Uh, the other advantage to ducted heat pumps, of course, is that you're kind of spreading that heat around. The ductwork can carry the heating and cooling throughout the entire building. 
And these come in all different flavors and sizes, enough to do a couple of rooms to an entire home type system. We also now have uh, an emerging technology called air to water heat pumps. Again, the outside piece looks very similar to what I've, pictures I just showed you. The difference here is that instead of either he heating up the air and blowing around heat heated or cooled air, you're actually heating or chilling water and moving water throughout your building in the way that you would have um, you know, radiators or radiant floors. So this is something we're really excited about. A lot of homes that have what we call hydronic or hot water distribution systems can take advantage of air to water heat pumps. And really probably the premium system that we have uh, out in the market are our ground source or often referred to as geothermal heat pumps. These are not using things like hot springs or anything like that. It's using uh, a traditional heat pump, um, pulling heat energy from normal ground. And the ground loop is often done um, vertically in the ground, several hundred feet in through one or more wells. Uh, and these uh, ground source heat pumps can heat. Uh, the difference here is you don't have a heat pump outside. Your heat pump sits in your basement and it's just pulling the heat out of that fluid that moves through the, the ground loop. Um, the cool thing here is these can tie into duct, duct work or into hot water. Uh, so there's really a lot of opportunities here and these are what we see as some of the best performing systems out there. Okay, so hot water, I mentioned that you can use heat pumps to do hot water and I bet there are folks that are on this uh, on this uh, webinar who have already have one of these units. Um, we know there's, like we said, about 14, 15,000 of these spread out amongst um, Monks, Vermont. Um, I own one in my own home. I have one in uh, a rental property, a couple of rental properties that I have. Uh, these are great. And what's really cool about them is that they're what we call a package system, meaning that the heat pump and the water tank, storage tank, are really kind of all in one. They're, uh, the black part in the picture here is the heat pump and the gray part below is the water storage tank. So you don't have to run any piping. This is just an appliance that usually you just bring into your basement, plug in, and it's kind of a one-for-one -one swap out for either a fuel, fired, or an electric water heater. Um, they use a, a fraction of the electricity that you would use as compared to an electric water heater. And they have this really cool side benefit of uh, dehumidifying your space, uh, especially if you're putting it in a basement that can be uh, something that's really great to have. So why would we install a heat pump system? So one of the, you know, the, the really obvious one is for a lot of people looking to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, people are putting on solar panels, they're, you know, putting, buying electric cars. This is another opportunity that we have to reduce our energy consumption and reduce our carbon footprint. So by, by moving to heat pumps, uh, Vermont is a very, has a very renewable generation, electric generation supply. So there is a substantial reduction in your carbon footprint by moving from a oil or propane or gas fired uh, heating equipment over to heat pumps. Of course, there is a quite a bit of opportunity to save money as well um, through the efficiency of this equipment, um, depending on fuel costs and what you're comparing to, there's definitely quite a bit of opportunity to save money on your energy bills. And a lot of people really love heat pumps because of the comfort that, that, that they provide. So in addition to getting air conditioning where you may not have had air conditioning before or being able to get rid of that annoying window air conditioner that breaks your back and gets nasty, you know, air conditioner water all over your feet every time you pull it out of the window or put it in every year. Uh, these are permanent installations. Um, but in addition to the air conditioning side, all of this equipment is what we call inverter driven. So that's just a fancy way of saying that it modulates up and down to meet a really, really steady temperature in the space. Most heating, traditional heating systems um, are run by a thermostat when the set point is 
not being reached, they kick on at full blast. They blast heat at you till they reach or exceed the set point, and then they shut off. And so it's an on, off, on, off versus uh, heat pumps. They come on, they find sort of their happy place, and they just sort of hum along to maintain a really, really steady, comfortable temperature. So achieving comfort, sometimes bringing heat or cooling to areas that don't have adequate heating and cooling is another reason why people install heat pumps. So as far as next steps, um, there are some things absolutely to consider. So one of the first things uh, that we do consider is, you know, what is the building um, envelope like, the building shell from a weatherization perspective? Weather, weatherizing first is something we absolutely encourage. Um, heat pumps are going to not only perform better, but you're gonna be that much more comfortable and use that much less energy uh, in your building uh, to keep yourself comfortable. So we absolutely would love to help you out with uh, any, any concerns you have about the level of weatherization of your building. And so uh, that's something that we definitely encourage is looking at that before jumping into the um, HVAC side, the, the heating equipment side. Um, Uh, equipment selection and installation. So as with any heating system, picking the right system for your needs is, is really critical, right? So we need to make sure that you're getting uh, what it is that meets what you're trying to accomplish. In other words, are you thinking about primarily cooling and doing shoulder season heating, right? Just spring and, and, and fall. Are you looking to move to net zero and get completely off of fossil fuels? Um, that's gonna mean some very different steps in terms of equipment selection. Um, installation best practices are something we work closely with our EEN contractors. Uh, Becca mentioned the EEN earlier. Absolutely encourage you to work with these EEN contractors, these are the folks that we work with closely to ensure that they have the training, the knowledge, the experience to do proper equipment selection and installation. So to find uh, an EEN contractor, you can go to the Efficiency Vermont website in the upper right tab, you see find a contractor or retailer. Uh, you can type in that you're looking for a contractor, type in heat pump and you'll get a list of contractors uh, based on um, zip code, essentially their proximity to where you are. Um, so it's, the other thing I think is really key to point out is that we're here to support you um, in any way, in many ways. And of course, financially is always a, a really critical piece to kind of overcome that first cost, right? We know you can save money operating the equipment, but some of this equipment can be really expensive. So we do have some great incentives right now, um, probably better than they've ever been. Um, for ductless and ducted heat pumps, as well as those heat pump water heaters, we have a great program in place with all of the distributors in the state, the wholesalers that sell this equipment. We have, uh, we're discounting the, per the, the cost of that equipment right there at the point of purchase. So ductless heat pumps, you can get up to $450 ducted, something we're really promoting. Uh, you can get up to $2,000 off and water heaters uh, are, are up to you know, $600 is the most common. Um, on the rebate side, uh, and what we mean by this is you pay for the, the installation and then you submit to us and we reimburse you. Uh, we, we, we help to offset the cost after the project is completed. Uh, for the air to water equipment that I mentioned, because this is still sort of new and we understand that that's a bit of a stretch for folks and they can be very expensive projects, uh, there is a, up to $6,000 off uh, those systems. So that's a, a tremendous, a tremendous rebate. I highly encourage you to take advantage of. Uh, the ground source heat pumps that we mentioned, I don't have a number to share yet. That, that's a program that is currently in development uh, and please check back with us in the next couple of months if that's something that you're interested in moving forward with. But we are looking at some 
very, very aggressive rebates to really move um, move this market as much as we can. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity with ground source heat pumps. And then for water heaters that are purchased through retail outlets or online, we do have a $600 rebate for those heat pump water heaters, the same ones that get the, the um, instant discount. You can't double that up, it's either or, but we have both of those available depending on the channel that you get access. So Becca mentioned financing. Um, we have the home energy loan. I don't know if any of you have ever taken advantage of this. This is really for uh, residential homeowners who uh, are looking to do heat pumps and, and other weatherization and, wood heat and advanced wood heating systems. We have some really great streamlined financing that we have bought down the interest rates on. So it, and it's, your interest rate will depend, um, you can see in the matrix here, depend on your uh, family income. But uh, some, again, really, really great program. I've personally gone through it. Uh, you can often get approved for your loan within, literally within hours. I think they guarantee within something like 24 hours. And with that, I think we are to our Q&A section. And I do know, um, Becca, I don't know if you want to come back on and facilitate that or if you want me to just jump on that. There we go. Yes. Okay. I think we're all set. I'll go ahead and start facilitating. Great job, Jake. Thank you. Um, yeah. I always learn something new and I'll, I'll say I have a heat pump in my house. So, um, okay. So, <laughs> um, so again, if folks want to ask a question and they want to say it to us, you can raise your blue hand and I'll try to promote you to panelists. But for now, looks like we've got some questions in the chat and you can also ask a question in the Q&A. So the first question I see is from Matthew Christie and he says, do you have brands yet of cold climate functional air to water heat pumps that can get to 190 degrees Fahrenheit for existing hydronic distribution retrofits? So a simple, straightforward one for you to kick it off. Thank you for asking the question, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. So <clears throat> the short answer is no. Um, we're, the, the technology right now is really, Mo almost all the equipment that we're seeing is focused on low water temperature distribution. So really the lower, the better, um, and which is why I when during that section, I, I didn't say thin to baseboard, I said radiant floors. Um, low temperature distribution is really key at this point in the technology development. So 190, Frankly, we shouldn't have systems being designed at all for 190 degrees. Usually 170 to 180 is about what we see for um, thin tube baseboard. Some as high as 190, um, but you're getting into uh, some real inefficiencies in system operation, even for traditional heating systems. So we're big advocates of low temperature distribution systems. They can be retrofit, it can be very expensive. Um, it is a challenge, absolutely. Um, air to water heat pumps are not plug and play for many, many homeowners because they do not have the distribution system to support their, um, you know, that type of low temperature water. When I say low temperature, I'm talking about, you know, 100 to 120 degrees is really optimal. Most of these air to water systems kind of cap out at 140 degrees. So, uh, but again, you're gonna see a pretty significant performance drop, efficiency drop, if you try to put out 140 degree water, you really wanna be in that kind of 100 and 110 sweet spot. So radiant floors are really the way to go or um, uh, radiant panels. Um, there's some, some good opportunities for that. So. Thank you, Jake. And I see we have a few questions coming in. Actually, I have, before we leave that topic, I do wanna have, one more, one more point out on that. There are new systems that are being developed. We've been holding out hope for a number of years that we would see kind of a plug and play system that could put out that 170, 180 degree water temperature so that 
we start to, we open up to the, the vast majority of people for retrofits. There are new systems using a, actually a carbon dioxide refrigerant that do have the capability of putting out those kind of water temperatures. There are no products available in the United States right now that have that capability, but they do exist. So stay tuned and come back in a year or two years and we'll, we'll do another session and see if we have updates for you. Thank you, Jake. Um, and we've got a bunch of questions. So uh, I really appreciate everyone um, engaging. Um, I'll start by saying we have had a few questions about getting contact information and the slide deck. Um, we can certainly provide the slide deck for you. Um, and rather than giving you Jake's email, I have one better for you, um, which is we can sign you up for a virtual home energy visit, which is a free home energy visit with an Efficiency Vermont Energy Consultant who will talk to you about, they can really talk to you about heat pumps, but they can also talk to you about your whole home and where you might have other um, potential uh, opportunities for efficiency. So I'm going to put that information in there and I'm also going to put my contact information. So if you do have something specific you want to ask, I can try to find the right person at Efficiency Vermont. So going to answer that question and the slide deck, I'll make sure that we um, send that out. If you registered today, you will have your email. So if you registered with an email, you should get it. Uh, and then uh, I have, a, I see a question from Ellen. She says, is it as easy as swapping out existing traditional electric water heaters with a heat pump hot water heater? So mostly <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the power, the wiring, the, the, all of the plumbing is all the same. The only dip, there are a couple of small differences. One difference is I mentioned that they dehumidify the space. What ends up happening is that the, in, this, in the case of the water heater, you have the condenser is essentially wrapped around the tank. And then the evaporator is a little coil that sits in that top portion um, of the, and that gets really cold, right? We talked about that. You have a cold liquid refrigerant there. And so long story short, you can have condensate, the condensation will form there and it has to be piped into a drain. Um, otherwise, you just end up dripping it all back over the floor and don't get any, any benefit of dehumidification. So that's the biggest difference. Um, noise can be a concern. I saw another comment, question about, about noise. So maybe I'll just address noise kind of all in one. Um, heat pump water heaters have gotten quieter and quieter and quieter. That said, if there's one thing I've learned working with customers related to heat pumps and sound, and sound is that everybody really has a very different threshold of what noise is considered a nuisance to them. So all, all heat pumps do have compressors in them, so they make noise. And um, heat pump water heaters now have gotten so quiet I always liken them to like the sound that a dehumidifier makes. So if you're familiar with that sound, that's about on par what most heat pump water heaters sound like. Um, they, that said, they can, they're, they're now kind of in these insulated boxes and the newer ones, you kind of have to go up super close and put your ear up to it to even hear has been my experience. Um, but again, I'm not going to tell you they don't make noise because some people it drives crazy. I have two young children. I listen to them scream all day long. I'd never hear my heat pump water heater. So it's, a, it's an issue of, of personal um, not, not sensitivity, I guess. As far as the heat pumps that sit in your space, again, you only have the evaporator uh, for space heating. You generally only have the evaporator or the non-compressor portion of it. So it's really just a fan um, and they are extremely quiet fans. You can hear a little bit of noise from um, like just the sound of the refrigerant in there, kind of like gurgly noises. Becca, you might, have, you might be able to speak to your own personal experience with that. Um, it's never bothered me, but again, I live in a, on a, I live on route two on a busy road and hear a lot of noise. So if I lived in a really pristine, quiet environment. I might, might bother me more. Well, I appreciate your, uh, 
your candor on that one, Jake. That's a question I've gotten before too. And I'm going to put in the chat um, a blog post that we actually have from Efficiency Vermont um, that talks a little bit about how you might make the decision around um, choosing a heat pump if it's right for you. Um, and personally, I would say we have had no reaction to the noise of our heat pump hot water heater. Um, and then being in buildings with heat pumps, um, yes, you know, you can hear them if you're looking, I would say, for the sound. Um, but there was a great, you can actually find online if you're really interested um, versus, you know, before COVID when you might be able to go to a friend's house and kind of listen to theirs. There are YouTube clips of uh, heat pumps making noises and you really have to get pretty close or turn your volume up pretty high to get a sense of the noise. So if you want to know more about that, I recommend checking out the blog posts I just put in the chat and um, some YouTube research might be <laughs> might be in store. Um, okay, tons of questions. So let's keep going. Um, and I see a lot of folks are asking questions specific to their homes. So again, signing up for that virtual home energy visit free service from Efficiency Vermont might be a helpful tool. Um, but let's uh, go to a question we got in the chat earlier, um, which is, uh, can you estimate the cost of installing individual heat pumps for apartment buildings, say per unit? And that question comes from Kirk. So as you saw from you know the presentation on different kinds of heat pumps there's a lot of ways to skin the cat um, in apartment buildings the most common that i've seen are what they call single zone ductless so you in that case what you're talking about is one outdoor unit one indoor unit and usually like a wall mounted type of situation so if we sort of restrict our thinking to just that scenario um, before you start getting into sort of rebates and things like that, uh, I think the average cost is around $3,500 to 5,000 in some cases, depending on the size of the unit. Um, I've seen people do smaller units um, or certain certain brands or certain contractors where you can get down even as low as 2500 but you're sort of in that range i think the average is about four thousand dollars thank you jake and um we uh have a great list of our rebates on the efficiency vermont website too so when you're thinking about that individual cost certainly um a great opportunity now when we think about um the rebates available as jake mentioned uh, okay, so we have another question here from John. Uh, John says, I have a three bedroom house with a finished basement. Can I manage with one pump upstairs and one downstairs or would it take pumps at multiple points on each floor? Yeah, these are these get really tricky to resolve without really getting into the details of you know what your building envelope is like and how broken up uh, the spaces in terms of internal partitions and what your existing distribution system is. So I, I, I can't answer that question directly. I will say that um, the more open a space is in terms of interior walls and closed doors and things like that, the more open it is, the better suited these kind of like wall or floor hung ductless units are. Um, the more broken up your space, um, the more uh, a distributed type system works better. So like a, a ducted system or an air to water system where you can really kind of get the, get that to all the, all the little rooms because you're really depending on, uh, you know, with a ductless heat pump, you're really depending on the heat to just kind of migrate its way through the building and closed off areas or lots of interior, interior walls really um, kind of slow that down. The other piece, of course, is how well weatherized the building is. Um, if it's really, really well weatherized, super tight, super insulated, um, the heat will want to stay in the building and migrate around inside the building more than it will want to escape through the exterior walls uh, or windows and doors. So it's definitely kind of a complicated thing to answer uh, in this forum, but um, yeah, those are some things to keep in mind. 
Thanks, Jake. And I do see we have a question similar to that, um, which is just asking um, about uh, their specific home. So I see your question, Sandra, in the chat about having a traditional cape. Um, so I think to Jake's point, if you've got a specific question, will it work? How will it work in my home with this type of room or this type of space? It mm -hmm. might be time to dive in and, and really figure out what works best for your home because we're not going to be able to give you really hard numbers on if it will work for you. Um, but we can give general advice as Jake just did. I will. One thing that I realized I had not included in the slides, but had intended to, I mentioned the displacement model. So in the, what that means is that we tend to think of our heating system situation as, you know, do I use this system or that system? Meaning if I have my existing system dies, do I get a new system that's a heat pump? What we're generally recommending for, for existing homes, if you're not building a new home or have a very new home, we're recommending keeping your existing heating system in place and using the heat pump to displace or offset um, your fossil fuel use to sort of the maximum extent that you can, the most cost effectively. So the most common scenario that we see is people have relatively open living spaces um, and you know the living kitchen dining kind of area usually on the first floor of the home and then a second floor that has little lots of little bedrooms and bathrooms um, that is again the most common not everybody's house by any means uh, and in those situations a heat pump located on the first floor is really the biggest bang for your buck that's where you can get a lot of heating distributed throughout that big open space. Some of it migrates upstairs as well. And you're offsetting a substantial portion of your heating costs um, or your heating fuel to the, to the heat pump um, versus putting a little heat pump in every single room can get very, very expensive in the upstairs. So, Again, if you keep your existing heating system in place, you have a way to continue to heat those bedrooms or supplement the heating in those bedrooms. Uh, you can often get away with a single heat pump on the main floor to do the bulk of your heating. Thank you, Jake. And uh, I'm taking a little bit of what you said and typing it in as an answer for a few of our question askers. So thank you. Uh, another question we got uh, from Jay is does ducted do ducted systems exchange the interior air or does it just use outside air? Uh, they are just using recycling the indoor air. They're not ventilation systems unless you tie in um, supply air into the you tie outside air into the supply. Gen so generally speaking, um, the way ducted systems work is the same way your furnace works. There's a return loop and a supply loop. Uh, and essentially the return is just taking the sort of ambient space air, you know, 70 degrees, whatever it is in your space, bringing it back to the furnace, heating it up, um, usually using oil or propane or gas, but in this case, using the heat pump to heat the air and then sending it back out to the space and the whole thing can, continues. Ventilation, um, outdoor air is a whole separate conversation that I would love to have in a future call. Um, and incorporating the two is an even another matter altogether, adds a lot of complexity. Generally speaking, we recommend keeping them separate. Thank you for that answer. Um, and something that we've had asked, um, Linda, um, our host, put it in the chat, and then we've also got the question in the Q&A section. Um, and something that I don't know the answer to, so I'm really intrigued. Uh, so heat pumps, they use a refrigerant. And for those of us who are kind of deep into some of the, uh, I would say, understanding of emissions and climate change and the impacts, um, we're learning more that refrigerant emissions matter um, and have a carbon footprint. Could you talk a little bit about 
that side of things and the refrigerant that heat pumps use. And then we also got a question that asked um, if you have any understanding of a comparison between let's say your high efficiency air conditioner um, with a ductless heat pump and, and if there's emissions understandings, uh, if there's an understanding of the emissions for those. I am so happy that somebody asked that question or how it sounds like more than one person did. So this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, especially as we see an increase in dramatic increase in these types of systems being installed. Um, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, the refrigerant that's used in almost all heat pumps is, is something called R410A. R410A has um, on a pound for pound basis compared to carbon dioxide is over 2000 times um, greater global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So it's, we, we need to keep the refrigerant in the pipe. Now keep in mind, we're not, unlike carbon dioxide, which is a um, intended byproduct of any combustion, um, refrigerant leakage only happens if something goes wrong. So it's not supposed to be being put in, you know, it's not part of the regular emissions. It's only when improper installation happens or there's some kind of um, catastrophic failure of some sort. So we really do need to keep the, the refrigerant in the pipe. We're doing a lot of work through the EEN to ensure that contractors have the training tools, knowledge, skills to um, do good installations to keep that refrigerant in there. Plus it's important, not just from an environmental perspective, but um, if the refrigerant leaks out, your system stops working. So there's, there's an, incon an inconvenience uh, layered on top of that. So keeping the refrigerant in the pipe uh, is really, really our main tool that we have right now. Um, but I will say that we are constantly keeping our eyes and ears open to any opportunities to move toward refrigerants that have less um, env environmental impact potential. So we're, we're keeping our eye on that. Um, as far as window air conditioners, ultimately what you, you know, they're using a lot of the same refrigerants. So it's really comparable. The difference has to do with charge size. It's how much refrigerants in the system. And that's a function of how big of a system it is. So, you know, there's, there's always gonna be a little bit more in a, in a ductless system or any kind of split system because you have all that piping that's full of refrigerant as well. Um, so, yeah, probably more more potential for definitely more potential for leakage on a split system, uh, meaning these ductless systems, than on a um, window air conditioner. Jake, I really appreciate you responding to that question because I I as I mount my uh, computer, I have it on top of uh, the drawdown edited by Paul Hawkins, and one of the first things that they talk about is refrigeration and yeah. how we can, as individuals, be accountable for how we use refrigerants. So I appreciate you giving that information to us. And um, yeah, there's that double edge. If it's leaking, it's probably not working and it's also bad for the environment. So I also, I also think it's worth pointing out that in all the analyses that we've done, looking at, you know, there, the difference between, let me just say, with heat pumps, if you're using a heat pump to offset the, you know, burning fossil fuel, there's carbon savings there, right? Mm -hmm. So we really have to think about the, if you look at the average amount that leaks out, you have to look at the comparison of what are you saving versus what are you adding back in, sort of like what's the net difference? And every analysis that's been done, not just by us, but by anyone that I've ever seen has shown a very dramatic savings, carbon savings, um, even with the unintended leakage that does come from these. We can do better, we're gonna do better, um, but we're still coming out way, way ahead for anybody who's really concerned about this. Mm. Uh, and looking that it's close to one, and I know we've got some time that we can dedicate to answer some more questions. If anyone has a question and they know, hey, I really had to go right at one, um, feel free again to raise your hand and I'll promote you. But I'm gonna go through the questions as received otherwise. 
Okay, so quick one from anonymous attendee. I got an estimate for Arctic air to water heat pumps that uses a newer version of the equipment than what is referenced in the equipment list for Efficiency Vermont's rebates. Are they still eligible? Can, do you mind if I take this one, Jake? Please. I highly recommend calling our customer support line um, if you're wondering about eligible product. product. Yeah, product. Um, and that would be my answer. Um, but maybe you've got something that's more specific. <laughs> I think the answer is, in this case, I can just say yes, it's going to fall. Um, <clears throat> we have, for our air to water program, we're really trying to transform a, a very nascent or sort of undeveloped market. Um, and so we're very open. We worked closely with Arctic. Uh, it's, it's just what's probably happened is it's you're ahead of us on the curve of, of getting that um, added to our list. So as long as it's part of their standard line and it isn't something odd, then it should be fine. And I do encourage you to get this in writing by connecting through our customer support. Um, that'll come to me probably, and it'll be a good trigger for me to uh, check in with them and make sure that we have the most you know current list. Uh, and then you'll get back an official written it's a lot of money you want to make sure before you make the decision to move forward <clears throat> that it is eligible but yes i'm almost certain it will be thanks jay and i'll go ahead and put in the chat our uh customer support line uh so if you'd like to call you can um and i'll put in the website that you can if you want to type it in as um like an info request there's a a contact form we have on the page as well uh before I do that, let's give you another question to respond to. Um, this, you know, I like this question. I would almost save it for the end, but I think it's it's valuable to, to just call out now. Um, Stephen asks, if one is starting with no heating system whatsoever, given the various options you've listed, what is the most efficient, least expensive option to install and operate? <laughs> What are they, what is that saying? Uh, good, quick and good, quick and easy pick two, right? Like, so yeah, I, it is hard to answer the, the question. There is no best answer. And I think it, it, it often, um, just like any, any good consultant, uh, questions are, whenever people ask me questions, I respond with questions back. Uh, my question back would be about what one's goals are um about what um meaning are we looking to get 100 percent electrification or partial are we looking to uh do air conditioning not air conditioning including hot water not including hot water meaning domestic hot water so and my answer as far as which system to recommend would be different depending on what your answers are but since this isn't a really convenient back and forth conversation, um, given the format. I will say that uh, for the best efficiency, ground source heat pumps cannot be beat. Um, they are also the only way in most homes to get to 100%, in many homes at least, to get to 100% electrification, no backup heating system. Um, of course, they don't get the they don't hit the, uh, the the inexpensive button. That said, uh, I know I couldn't give you any numbers, but what I will say is that there's gonna be a, a program in place with the goal of getting uh, ground source heat pumps on par with kind of a traditional heating system in terms of cost. So <clears throat> if we can, achieve that, then I would say that that hits all of your, crosses all of your, uh, checks all your boxes. Uh, that said, we are seeing very common in, in new construction, at least, that's usually the only place where you see no heating system, or something new construction-esque, heating a space that hasn't been heated before, um, can be done inexpensively with good, very good performance with an air source heat pump. And that can be a variety of different, it can be ducted, it can be ductless. It just, again, depends on the type of building and how it's laid out and what the goals are. Thank you. 
Uh, and then I, I like this question because I think the answer is a, is a resounding yes, but are these low maintenance? Um, they, <laughs> oh, no. they are, but they're not. The maintenance no I haven't been doing? Oh, no. <laughs> they are not no maintenance. And I think that this is something that's been missing from a lot of our conversation about this is it's, it's not an, it's not mad. It's, it's magic in the way it operates, but it's not magic in the fact that it's still a piece of equipment that needs to be maintained. So some very regular maintenance that needs to happen, um, you'll see in much of the equipment, uh, if you have any of these kind of wall mounted or floor mounted units, there are some filters that need to be cleaned. Um, not a big deal. You just wash them in your, usually wash them off in your sink or uh, with a hose there, that takes two minutes. They pop in, pop out. You don't even need tools or anything like that. Um, you also should be getting an annual cleaning. Um, so the coil that I showed you, the out, especially the outside, inside, some people, depending on if you have a lot of, if you have a lot of animals, particularly dusty house, smoke in the house, any of those kinds of things, you can have uh, build up on the coil inside as well. You have a pre-filter, but it doesn't get everything. So the coil, the ability of the unit to do its job, it needs to be able to exchange heat energy, both in the inside and outside, and they can get gunked up with stuff. And if they're gunked up with stuff, they will degrade in their performance over time. So every year you should really get them cleaned. Um, it's not that complicated, but it's definitely something you wanna have done professionally. They use specialized cleaners that don't mess things up. You can bend the little fins if you get too crazy with like people have done them with pressure washers and then they bend all the fins. And so there's things you can mess up. So it's best, I think, to hire it out. Um, they use certain, like I said, certain types of cleaners. I'm sure if you YouTube it, you'll figure out a, the right cleaner and the right type of equipment and you can start doing it yourself. Um, I'm a DIYer myself and I know a lot of you probably are as well. So I, you know, absolutely, it can be done, but generally speaking, recommend it done professionally. I appreciate that. And that's such a Vermonter answer to be a DIYer. <laughs> we love to do sure. it. You know, half the people on this call are like, I could do that myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so another question we had, which, again, I, I don't think I've thought about it um, before, but... Um, a cool idea. Uh, so smart thermostats. Um, are smart thermostats useful for heat pumps or is the steady state approach more efficient? These are, these are great questions. So there's been, this has been an, a question we've been getting for several years because people either already have or, and, and often love their smart thermostat. Um, I will say that there are some compatibility issues just to start. Um, so even if there potentially were benefits, you often can't use your smart thermostat with your heat pump. That's not always the case, but it's definitely something that you need to look at. Um, you know, one thing that's been very frustrating is that most of the heat pump manufacturers use proprietary controls. So they wanna sell you their special thermostat and you can't just connect it to some third-party thermostat without it actually impacting the um, performance of the equipment, if it works at all. So with that as a disclaimer, I will also say um, it was a very insightful tag-on portion of the question, which asked about whether or not there's even anything to gain if you can do that. And I the, the short answer that I give to people is not really. Um, there can be some very small benefits, but the main benefit that we see with smart thermostats is in helping you with setbacks, right? So anything from occupancy controls to, uh, I'm sorry, occupancy sensors to, you know, better scheduling, smart scheduling, um, Theoretically, a smart thermostat doesn't save any more than a programmable thermostat. It's just that, generally speaking, it's just that people don't generally set up their programmable thermostat properly. So it kind of takes some of the, uh, I don't know, 
human error out of it, I guess. Um, I think that's the kindest way I can say it. So the so we don't really want to use third setbacks, at least not daily setbacks with heat pumps. Um, I didn't really get into the explanation of why. I did explain that they do kind of hum along at steady state. But what I didn't say is that that's how they want it. That's how they really want to, to operate. That's how they're the most efficient. Heat pumps use a lot of energy when they, when they get into uh, what we call a recovery mode, which is when they find themselves kind of well below the set point. So for example, in my house, we set, you know, if you set back to 60 degrees at night, when you come back in the morning and you want it to be 68, the heat pump says, whoa, I'm six, I'm eight degrees off of set point. And it ramps up into like an overdrive mode. It runs the compressor at 110% of its, of its kind of rated capacity, sucks a huge amount of energy. It's the least efficient operation um, because it's struggling to provide that comfort. So there's a lot of conversation to not to go too much on a tangent or get into too much detail, but there's there's some nuance about sort of a smart recovery and kind of incrementally raising the temperature to recover. Um, but we're not quite there yet. And I think the simple answer is just set, find your whatever temperature it is with your heat pump that you're comfortable at, leave it alone. If you're going away for overnight or multiple days, um, setting it back makes sense. You're gonna save more energy than you'll lose during the recovery period. But I, generally speaking, I say for anything, la anything like a daily normal setback, it's not worth it. But going away for 24 hours is worth it or more. Uh, very interesting. And I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about when you think you're being efficient by lowering your temperature, mm -hmm. right? But oh, no. So that's a helpful tip. And we've actually, we're down to our last Q&A question. Um, so we might be, you know, just wrapping up uh, right at 115 if that works for folks. Um, and I think this question you'll like a lot, Jake. Um, so Paul asks, using the displacement model and acknowledging that it will vary by home, what is generally the point at which it makes sense to use your traditional heat source versus your heat pump? Mm. Ah, yes. So again, answering a question with a question depends on what your goals are. So <clears throat> for people that are looking to maximize the amount of fossil fuel that they're offsetting. Otherwise, you could say, you know, having the largest impact on their carbon footprint. Um, that would be one answer. <laughs> uh, the other, the other question, the other way of looking at it is where is sort of where do you reach cost parity? In other words, at what point does the operation of the heat pump um, technically starting to cost you more than if you were to switch over to your other fuel. So, and the answer is gonna be different based on which of those things you're trying to accomplish. So again, with, with that kind of um, putting the question back to you, I often throw around five degrees as, as a really um, kind of, sweet, you know, common sweet spot. It's not a one size fits all. It depends on many, many, many factors. Uh, how expensive your existing fuel is, which heat pump you get, the size of that heat pump, um, your, the building that it's heating, how much of that space in the building that you're trying to heat. All of those things change the equation, but five degrees is often the temperature that I encourage uh, contractors and, and homeowners to think about when sizing equipment is to, to pick equipment that's going to provide adequate heating for whatever the goals are um, down to five degrees. Now that said, um, you know, that's not carved in stone. You know, I in my, you know, there, there are things that really dramatically can change that if you have, I know you don't have natural gas down in your neck of the woods, but you know, where I live, we have gas and it's extremely cheap. And so the advice that we give to people with gas can often be, 
Um, unless you want to spend a lot more on your heating, you might want to swap over at something more like 20 or 30 degrees. So um, that's my kind of not quite answer answer. <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah. And seeing that we don't have any more questions in the chat, um, I, I'll start to wrap up and, and say thank you. Um, Jake, that was fabulous. I'm so happy that we had you do this because as soon as the first question came in, I was like, whoop, I'm glad we have an expert because <laughs> that would not have been answered half as well by me. So um, I'm excited that uh, we actually have another one of these coming up. So if folks love this and you can't, you need more heat pump. Um, we're actually doing another one of these presentations next week with the Norwich Energy Committee. More likely though, if you have friends or someone who is interested in heat pumps that you'd like to send information to them so they can attend, um, please go ahead and do that. Um, but- uh, Becca, before we sign off, I do see a couple more questions oh, that we did, I miss some? did miss. Oh. Um, so there was one from Teresa. Oh yeah, let's do that. Um, that can be no that so I've heard that we did address this to a certain extent. Um, we we addressed the noise issue, but there's also a, the second part of it is that I've heard that they can significantly increase one's electric oh, yeah. bill and may not necessarily decrease one's energy bill. What is your experience with this? And I I, I, I don't want to let that one go because I think that's it's it's something we we've all heard probably from different people. So. There's nothing really magic about, um, you know, using a heat pump as the, ultimately there's going to be one of a few different results, right? You're either going to heat the space up more than it ever was before, and that could drive up your energy costs, or you're going to maintain the same level of heating and it's now being done by the heat pump and not your other heating system, right? So it's not just additive, it's replacing something unless you're just, you used to keep the house at 60 and now you're keeping it at 70. Um, and so the only other factors are, you know, what is the, is there something potentially wrong with the heat pump where it's operating at some really, really poor efficiency? Um, I think people get stressed about that because they see a big, you know, my, my bill went up $150 a month or $200 a month. You know, generally speaking, that isn't really, it's just so uncommon. Um, people tend to think that that's the issue, but it really very, very rarely is. Um, I will say that if you're really looking to optimize performance, a single zone heat pump is better than a multi-zone heat pump. Uh, and the question as it relates to seeing your other energy bills not go down as much, I think this is where we, it, it becomes very difficult for the average person to kind of like really get a grasp of this. And it's the reason why it is because of just the way these, the signals we get are so varied. One is a monthly bill that we see that's very regular. And all of a sudden we see it jump up, right? And it, there's just that immediate kind of feedback loop versus with a um, bulk delivery of fossil fuels, whether you're talking propane or, um, or, or oil, you get these sort of, most people are not on a monthly delivery cycle. They're filling up twice, three times a year. Um, it's difficult to know when you often, when you end a certain, you end a season and then you had a full tank versus an empty tank can be a whole nother fill up or not in that following season. Um, you know, we even struggle when we do sort of analyses of, of different projects. We need to see multiple years of heating deliveries. We actually tie the amount of fuel that's used to the heating degree days, which has to do with essentially how what the temperature is at any given time. So we can actually tie the gallons of fuel used to how cold it was. And without doing that, it just becomes very difficult to kind of tangibly compare what your electric bill went up versus what your oil bill went down. Um, but I can tell you that again, there's this is pretty straight physics. If you're keeping your building steady in temperature, you're gonna see your electric bill go down 
your electric bill go up, but less than your oil bill goes down. Um, and again, it also depends on how much you're paying for those things. If you have expensive electricity and cheap, and a, you know, very cheap oil or, or, or gas, it, it might not be as compelling for you as if you're paying, you know, when the, um, you know, propane was $4 a gallon. So anyway, that's no. my, <laughs> it, it just, this comes up quite often. I'm so happy you jumped in and apologies, Teresa. I see you're still here. So I'm glad we got to that. Um, one it thing was, I was one more here um, from David about um, basement cellar temperature. Yeah. So again, um, a great question. So as we learned in that little science section, if, it, if for folks who followed it, the heat energy is coming from the, essentially the ambient space and, and or, or it's it's wherever you're collecting or where the, wherever that evaporator is. And for heat pump water heaters, it is the space that the thing is operating in. So it is the water, the, the heat that's going into the water is coming out of the basement, simply put. So the cooler your basement is, the less, the harder the water heater has to work to get heat at, energy out of it and the colder it's going to make the space that it's in. So, a couple of things. One, um, 50 degrees doesn't concern me uh, particularly. The units are going to work fine as long as they don't get down anywhere near kind of freezing temperatures. If you're getting, if you're seeing freezing temperatures in your basement, we need to be talking to you about um, a home performance project or some kind of weatherization. You shouldn't be getting that cold in your basement. You need to separate uh, the inside from the outside a little bit better in your basement. Um, and that will have lots and lots of benefits in addition to running a better performance for your heat pump water here. The other part of the question, which is how much is it going to cool it down? Um, the, the, that again depends on how much volume you have in your basement. If it's a teeny tiny little space, it's going to cool it down more than if you have a big, huge open space. Uh, but the general guideline is three to five degrees in. Um, reduction in temperature while the unit's running. And then it kind of normalizes and kind of evens back out. So while it's running, I've tracked my own, runs about uh, two to th about three hours a day. So during that three out of 24 hours, it'll drop down three to five degrees, depending on how big your space is, and then it will recover in the other 21 hours. Thank you, Jake. And one other piece that I did want to touch base on with um, your response earlier to Teresa, which I've heard from a lot of folks, is if you've never had an air conditioner that or air conditioning in your home in the summer to do cooling, I've definitely run into Vermonters who they do see an increase in their electricity costs, not necessarily because they're properly using their heat pump to heat, but because they've fallen in love with the fact that they can now cool their homes. So if you are not used to having um, an air conditioner or you're just kind of opening your windows when it's hot out, a heat pump will be a great addition to your comfort, but you might actually be increasing some of your costs because you're in love with the fact that you can now be nice and cool um, in certain parts of your building that you weren't before. Uh, so I did want to add that. And did I miss anybody else, Jake? Or I don't know. I think that was all of them. Um, <laughs> The, the one other point on that, on the cooling piece is absolutely, um, if you haven't been air conditioning, it does, it's going to increase your cost. There's, that, there's no way around that. I will say that as air conditioners, they cannot be beat from a performance perspective. So they're, they're the quietest air conditioner. They're the most efficient air conditioner. They are the least hassle and the best kind of comfort experience in terms of that ability to modulate. So um, if air conditioning is on your list of wants and desires, it is the best way to do it is with a heat pump, um, but you will pay something for it. And, and again, I, that said, uh, the efficiency in cooling mode is, far and above better than what you have in, in, in heating mode. And 
many customers, not all, but many report back that they see zero difference in their electric bill because there's just such, I mean, we live in Vermont, it's not Arizona. We don't have that much cooling load. So it, 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 is, it doesn't drive, you're not gonna drive it up by hundreds. It would be by tens of dollars. So. Ah, great point. And who doesn't like to think about summer coming our way soon? I mean, woo. <laughs> I, want to be, I want to turn my air conditioner on. We want to do it.